So we have two final stains that we're going to do today. We're going to do the acid fast stain. Uh, and we're using the particular method, the ZN method, and endospore 2, we're using the Schaefer Fulton method to be able to visualize the endospores. So this is the way acid fast look. And AFB is a common abbreviation, as I said earlier, stands for acid fast bacilli. So these guys, these bacteria are all rod shaped. Uh, they retain the primary stain, which is this carbofusion, this fusion color, this purplish pink. They also tend to clump together, as you can see here. And this is um, because they're hydrophobic. They don't like water. And so they, it, it's, it, they just kind of get clustered together uh, when we're preparing them for staining. So why do they have this particular um, staining ability? If you were to stain them using the Gram stain, notice they have a layer of peptidoglycan and no outer membrane. So they would come out gram positive. They'd come out purple. But in addition to the peptidoglycan layer, notice that they have these mycolic acids. And these are waxy-like substances. And this is why they have such a strong affinity to the carbofusion dye that we use. So much so, as I said, when we use acid alcohol to decolorize, it does not remove the color from these membranes. Anybody know another step in the procedure that's actually going to affect this waxy substance and really impegment the dye into these slides? What are we going to do to these slides as they're staining? We're going to heat them on our steam pots, right? And what happens to wax when you heat it? It melts, right? You ever melt candles, right? Anything that falls into that wax, forget about it. You're not getting it out after it solidifies, right? So it's kind of the same thing is going to happen here. They're going to become melty. That dye is going to get in it, right? And then when we, when we take them off the heat and they cool off a little bit, it's going to be really hard, actually impossible. I've never seen, in all the years of my working with acid fast, I've never seen an acid fast organism decolorize. So today you do not have to worry about over decolorizing. <laughs> it won't happen. It's going to be stuck. So they, the phospholipids, each chain could have um, 12 to 20 carbons, right? So really large molecules, too, these mycolic acids. Um, so short chains from 20 to 26, long chains, 50 to 60 carbons long. So really big molecules, just huge. So, give you examples of some pathogens. Mycobacteria leprae, and again, remember I said mycobacteria, right, are what are going to stain acid fast, that particular genus. So, um, leprosy is caused by a mycobacterium. So, I actually worked in research with leprosy, um, had to do this stain numerous times. We were trying to count these bacteria from animal and human samples, and... Um, this still exists even today, leprosy does. So this is some information about the disease itself, right? You guys don't need to know it for this class, but a lot of you guys that are going into allied health, right, this is um, good information to know. So it's, it's treated pretty much on an outpatient basis nowadays because we don't quite get the debilitation we used to get in the past. There's not the stigma around it that there used to be. Uh, but we still have about 100 cases in the United States each year. And um, it is endemic in Louisiana and Texas, um, especially in the armadillo population. They um, actually um, harbor this bacteria. So um, one of my favorite stories was that when I was in research there, there was an Indian lady that I was working with. And before I came on to study the epidemiology, like how prevalent it is in the armadillo population, they would have different researchers. They'd have kits in their cars. And when they'd see roadkill armadillos, they'd take samples and bring it back to the lab, and we'd be able to test if that armadillo had leprosy or not. So one day it was raining out, so she's with her daughter, and her daughter's holding the umbrella, and she's taking samples off this roadkill armadillo, right? And this guy in a pickup truck comes by, and he comes over and says to her, that roadkill is not good eating. It's diseased. He felt the need to tell this poor foreign woman, right, that that particular roadkill you shouldn't eat because it carries disease. So it's good that, you know, the general population, the good old Cajuns, right, they know that that particular roadkill 
Not good. Don't eat it. Don't risk it. Because <laughs> in preparing it, you could expose yourself to the bacteria. And if you're susceptible, the good news with this one is that most people aren't even susceptible to this infection. Um, and that's also why it tended to run in families, because they were susceptible. And families live in the same type of environment, right? So you'd have the same type of exposure. But it's not, not necessarily genetic, but it is genetic the predisposition to actually um, be susceptible to this infection. Uh, and most people aren't, thankfully. So they have an awesome leprosy museum um, up in Carville, St. Gabriel, right outside of Baton Rouge, where the last leper colony was up until about the 80s. Um, and there's actually some people, some lepers still live there. Of course, they don't have the infection anymore. It can be treated with, with antibiotics. It is a bacterial infection. We do know what antibiotics treat it. Unfortunately, it attacks the peripheral nerves and can cause damage. So they don't have any feeling. And then they get secondary infections and damage. And that's why they tend to lose limbs and stuff before we uh, were able to treat. Um, there's di different forms of the leprosy as well, um, where you have a cellular response by your body where you can get some of these deformities. And then the worst case, where your body um, does an antibody response and the bacteria grow uncontrolled. Um, and can kill you. Um, so there were people that actually um, died from it as well before we had treatment and proper diagnoses. So, what did Peter write? Yeah. So another one that is a serious problem nowadays um, more so than leprosy is mycobacteria, mycobacteria tuberculosis. Um, and this one, co of course, causes tuberculosis. And as few as 10 bacteria you can inhale and get this infection. So this is a really serious infection. We do the TB test to help um, early detect because it's a very slow progressing disease. The problem with this is if you've been vaccinated, your TB test will come out positive. And if you're going into the health field and you might be somewhere where they test very often the TB test, your TB test could almost like vaccinate you. And then once you come up positive, you'll always be positive. What it is is your immune system is recognizing that the specific proteins from that bacteria. Um, and so once positive, always positive. So for detection, then they have to do chest x-rays um, to make sure that you don't have this uh, particular lung infection. Again, treated with antibiotics. The bad news with antibiotics nowadays, we get a lot of antibiotic resistance building up, especially with this type of infection, because it's such a slow progressing infection. Infection, people have to be on antibiotics for six months to even years, and you know how people are; they're just not very good at keeping up with treatment. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we have so many um, antibiotic uh, resistant strains of tuberculosis. So we have to use other antibiotics than the standard regime. And when you're taking antibiotics for these guys, you're taking like two or three antibiotics at a time, too, not just one. And this was also known uh, back in the day as consumption, right? When people died of consumption, it's probably what they had was tuberculosis. Again, slow progressing disease. Um, anybody watch Texas Rising? good series on History Channel. One of the guys in it had t tuberculosis and died. Poor dude just coughing and coughing and to the point where the infection was so bad he couldn't breathe anymore. Right? Suffocated to death. So um, this is a opportunistic pathogen that can affect the lungs which also stains um, gram positive uh, necordia and can't remember what type of organism it is. Peter didn't put it in here. This is rare, but it can cause infections in the valves. It can attach to the valves inside the heart. This one is um, a eukaryote parasite. I knew that. Right, so remember right, when I talked about mycobacteria, I was referring to just bacteria. So this is another one that's mentioned in your book. Um, these are obligate intercellular eukaryotes, so they get inside of the cells. And when you acid fast stain them, and this is not an acid fast stain, 
um, it'll help you visualize their spores. Um, and so remember, we looked at Plasmodium fissiparum, right, inside red blood cell. That's also another obligate. It's got to live inside to reproduce inside the cells. So there are three common eukaryotes, Toxoplasmosa. Most women are familiar with this one. We get the poster on that um, because cats can carry this um, parasite and it can cause serious problems for our pregnant women, right? So they say, you know, I got out of cleaning the litter box when I was pregnant with that. But if you have house cats, chances are they haven't picked up this bacteria because they pick it up from the environment. I mean, this protozoa. They pick it up from the environment from eating, you know, dead mice and birds and stuff like that. So if you have house cats, they probably don't even have this infection. But they have all kinds of other bacteria and stuff like that. You should always wear gloves, even a, a face mask when you when you change the litter box if you have a cat. There's all kinds of nasty stuff in there that can make you sick. And you definitely don't want to get sick when you're pregnant. So you'll see that we have, right, our staining apparatus. They just have a metal beaker in the book. That's the only difference. And we have our screen. And so you're going to place your four slides for your lab bench on the screen. We have filter paper that you're going to put on top of the slide. So it goes slide, filter paper. The reason why I say this is I had someone last semester trying to do it in the opposite order. The reason for the filter paper is to keep the moisture, keep it from evaporating quickly of the stain. So one person needs to, in your group, watch it at all times. So you can switch out and do other things, right? but always have one person over it and adding drops of the dye as it starts to dry out. You want it to be shiny, moist, the whole five minutes that you're staining, okay? Then we can just take the whole staining uh, screen off, right? Put them on our individual staining trays, decolorize, and counter stain. It's just the first step for these two stains that you're gonna do with heat. And that's how you're gonna do it, is we have our steaming water, which I think we're getting there, huh? Getting warm. It'll be hopefully ready to go by the time I finish our lecture. Okay, so how does this heating, the bacteria, during this part of the procedure, how does this help? What happens to those lipids when we heat them? They melt, right? And the dye is going to stick inside of them. So the heating melts the waxy mycolic acid in the acid fast cell walls. Carbon fusion we're using is lipid soluble, which means it dissolves into that liquid. Liquid. Just like with the gram stain, remember we are going to stain these cells, all of them, with the carbon fusion. The difference is in the differential step when we decolorize, right? We're going to be removing the dye from the acid fast negative or non acid fast. So are acid fast negative cells stained by carbofusion? Yes, right? But then we're going to decolorize them. So gram negatives will decolorize, the gram positives will stay, I mean, excuse me, the acid fast ones will stay stained, right? They will not decolorize. The non-acid fast will, so therefore we have to counter stain them. Why do you suppose the acid fast stain is not as widely used as the gram stain? And as many organisms have it. Right, not as many of them are acid fast. Remember, I said it's only one genus of bacteria, mycobacteria. So if you were to start out with that stain and it came out negative. The only thing you've eliminated is mycobacteria. You have a multitude of possibilities of different types of bacteria out there. Where with the gram stain, right, you're going to get positive or negative, and it basically is going to narrow down your possibilities in half. About 60% of bacteria are gram negative, about 40% are gram positive, right? So that's the first stain that's the most commonly used. Now, if the organism comes out gram-positive, and it's rod-shaped, right, and they're clumping together, what would you probably do next? You'd probably do an acid fast, because there's some indication you may have an acid fast organism. The fact that they're rod-shaped, they're clumping together, and they're gram-positive, right? And they'll tend to be a lighter purple, right? They don't, they don't 
but the gram stain, the purple doesn't really get into them really well because of that waxy layer. So again, when we do the procedure, these guys are going to stay stained with the carbofusion. The counter stain is going to make no difference for that. It's not going to stain them. For our non-acid fast, we're going to stain them with carbofusion, but we're going to decolorize with acid alcohol. They're going to become clear. In order to see them, we got to stain them. We're going to use methylene blue. We're using the zealand methan method. They'll be a bluish gray color, and again, they're going to not be very pretty, vibrant color. So they get highly damaged by that uh, acid alcohol. Right, so they don't come out very pretty usually. They're kind of dull. <laughs> so here's some examples. Right, again, you'll probably see them really clumping together. Sometimes they're going to almost look cockeyed just because the rods have kind of shrunk up. Um, but you'll really see them. You know, you might see a big old clump. But kind of go to the edge, right, where you're seeing the individual cells. We have a mixed culture, so you should see both, right? You should see uh, Staphylococcus epidermis, these um, bluish, grayish, um, cocci in clusters, and then hopefully you will see the acid fast. You're going to have to scan around on your slide, right, to see both organisms. But you should hopefully see both in both colors. So why are we doing this experiment? What are we trying to see if they're acid fast, right? If you suspect it's a mycobacterium, right, you do the acid fast procedure. How do you perform it, right? We're going to do primary stain over the steam for five minutes. We're going to decolorize with acid alcohol. Like I said, it's hydrochloric acid. And then we're going to counter stain for one minute. These you do on your staining trays, right, steps two and three. What are the outcomes that we're going to see? What are you going to look at under the microscope? You're going to look at color, and you're going to look at shape and arrangement of your cells, right? So your acid fast are going to be um, the bacilli, and they're going to be the fuchsia color and clumped together. Your gram negative should be your bluish, greenish, gray color, right? Those are our non-acid fast. How would you record in words? You could sketch. You could even take photographs, right? What does it mean, though? Gram positive, I mean, ah, acid fast positive or acid fast means that they have that mycolic acid, right? And they're probably a mycobacterium. Gram negative, they do not contain the mycolic acid. They're probably not mycobacteria, right? And they don't have that uh, mycolic acid. The last one is endospore stain. These are unique, again, to bacteria, these structures. So they're dormant. Well, usually when we say spores, we're talking about reproduction. In this case, it's not. It's a dormant cell type. So they're just kind of chilling why things are bad, right? When they run out of food, nutrients, when they become dehydrated, or temperatures are not optimal, and, and this could be cold or hot, right? Some of us, you know, have to have it just right. Alteration in, in oxygen availability, and even carbon dioxide can affect them. Uh, the spore coat ultimately protects the genetic information, the DNA. Right? That's what it's protecting. Because with that information, they can become that cell once again, actively metabolizing like they were previously. When they're actively metabolizing, they're referred to as a vegetative cell. Right? When it's actively metabolizing, it has the ability to reproduce. And it's going to do this when conditions become favorable. So saprophytes, I don't think we defined this yet, right? Heterotrophs we did. So a heterotroph that digests dead or organic matter, right? A decomposer is a saprophyte. A lot of these organisms that are endospore formers, right? When these, for these foods are available, when an animal dies, a plant in the forest, this is how they're decomposed and become part of the soil is organisms like this. Well, think about it. When they run out of food, they would die. So instead of dying, they go into this dormant cell state. What does heterotroph mean? It relates to where the carbon they use to build their bodies comes from, right? It has to do with what they're eating. They're eating organic matter, right? So stuff that was once living. Keratin 
is a family of fiber structural proteins. It's found in our skin, our hair, our fingernails. Very strong version is found in the hooves and horns and shells of other animals. It is the main protein that makes up the outer covering of bacterial endospores. Okay? So really strong protein coat they pack around their DNA to help protect it. Because of that, this is really hard to penetrate. Right? So when we try to kill these organisms when they're in the endospore state, it's really difficult. Because chemicals don't penetrate, UV light can't really penetrate, some radiation can't even penetrate. You can't dry them out, they're already dry to begin with. The process of forming the endospore dehydrates them. So drying any further is not going to affect them. Right? They're not actively metabolizing. So even if some chemicals could get in, they can't disrupt. So the only thing that's effective at killing these is high pressure steam in an autoclave. And again, it's that under pressure, the heat, the liquidness of that steam can penetrate into those endospores and disrupt the DNA and destroy them so that they can't re-germinate. A dry heat, you would have to do it longer. And dry heat is what we do in lab, right? When you incinerate them. Uh, and since we have such a small number, it will destroy those endospores. Excellent question. So she has dry heat, right? It usually just has to be longer. So if you had a large number of bacteria, you'd have to do it for a really long time. And that's why we incinerate um, medical waste. It's the only way you can completely destroy. And it's also why even some of our waste in general, we cremate people, right? and animals. You completely destroy them into ash and minerals. All the water has been removed. The ashes, the carbon, and then the minerals. Nothing living after that. So here's a picture of, of the horns, right? And so this is just like our fingernails. is also made of keratin, um, but it actually has bone in the middle that supports the growth. Those guys have got some pretty horns. So what's some pathogenic ones, right? Like I said, anthrax. And so there was a scare not too long ago of some powder. That was millions upon billions of spores. So when the people inhaled them, the spores were able to sense they were an environment nutrient rich. They became vegetative cells again, became reproducing. They produce toxins. And um, in some cases, even with treatment, will kill you, right? And that's the scary thing about this one. For the most part, um, the spores have been eliminated from the environment here in the United States, but it is prevalent in other parts of the world, right? And that's why some people, especially military members, are vaccinated. That's why there's a scare that they could use it for bioterrorism. We don't, we don't vaccinate the general public because you shouldn't hopefully be exposed to it. So this goes into some of the different components of it. Clostridium tetani is one we do worry about. This is a spore form and unfortunately widely available in the environment in the spore form. Um, and so if you step on a rusty nail in your yard, it's not the rust. It's the fact that if it's rusty, it's been in your yard for a long time. What's the chances it has these spores on it? Pretty high. And if you step on it, you probably got a puncture wound. These type of wounds can be in an anaerobic environment. And this is the type of environment the spores need to become vegetative cells and reproduce. The bad news with this one is the toxin it produces. So every 10 years you should get your booster against the toxin. They actually give you a form of the toxin that's safe to get your body to produce antibodies against it. So if you're exposed, right, and the organism grows, you can neutralize that toxin before it affects your muscles. And it actually affects your motor neurons. Your inhibitory motor neurons that tell your muscles to relax this stops it. This toxin stops them. So people stay contracted. And so that's an, another reason why it's called locked jaw, because it tends to manifest in the jaw region first, right, where the people can't open their mouth. Uh, and then it can affect breathing, right, because you need muscles to breathe, and you can die that way, again, from not being able to breathe. So it is an important one. So Lots of bacillus, as we've seen, like bacillus anthrax, and a lot of clostridium species have the ability to produce endospores. And these are two of particular note because there are pathogens, the bacillus anthrax and uh, clostridium tetani. Uh, 
um, and then Clostridium botulism. All right, so this is another one where, again, it's a toxin producer, and we actually use um, its toxin modified for lots of different procedures nowadays, again, to stop muscles from contracting so that you don't end up with wrinkles. But they've used it for a bunch of other different things, again, because of its ability to numb um, the nerves and stop muscular contraction. But it also can be found in your food and cause uh, foodborne illness. And that's what we worry about for, for that one. Clostridium perfigens. This is another one. Again, the spore is available in the environment. Um, you could get it into a wound. If you have a serious wound that hasn't been cleaned, it has dirt in it. And this organism grows under those anaerobic conditions, produces toxins, destroys the cells. Right, and cause a really serious gangrenous um, situation. Not commonly seen in the United States because, again, we usually clean wounds properly when you have serious wounds, uh, but it can happen. Clostridium difficile is one you'll probably run into, unfortunately, um, one time or another if you work as a nurse. Uh, this one apparently smells really bad. Um, this infection will happen in the gut for individuals. Um, again, it's a spore former in the environment. Usually something has disrupted the normal flora in the person's gut, and this organism has taken over. Um, so it causes a really serious infection where it literally can destroy the large intestines. And the very interesting thing one of my students said, one of the ways they help um, get people to recover from this is they actually have to do a fecal transplant usually from someone else in the same household because you're exposed to the same normal bacteria, they're going to put their poop into your intestines to repopulate the bacterial population back to normal. I, I don't know. I didn't ask specifics about this procedure. and, and Yeah, that's why I said I didn't ask specifics. I, I, I didn't really want to know that day. But it makes sense that they would do that. And did you guys read about those Indians that we had put the thing? So because, you know, in urban environments, right, we become these super clean people, right? And we don't expose ourselves to a lot of the microbes. So we have a lot less microbes in our gut. And there's this big thing about probiotics now and getting good microbes in your intestines to help you with digestion and digestive health. Those people, you know, I mean, you saw them rolling around in the mud in the picture, right? They're exposed to, they have the most diverse bacteria in their guts and are some of the healthiest people on earth, right? And they're rolling around in the mud, right? So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have bacteria, especially if you have a lot of different ones of the good ones. So this particular population, they got so much good bacteria, they even have linked particular ones to why they have no kidney stones in their in their native populations, right? They're really quite healthy. So we kind of put ourselves in a disadvantage of being super clean. You can actually go too far in the other direction. Uh, but when it comes to organisms like this, right, you don't want them um, becoming the prominent ones in your intestines. They'll cause serious disease. And apparently very smelly. Um, most nurses are like, you know before you even walk in the room that they have this particular infection. So as I said, well, one of the things we were, when scientists are trying to determine if they don't know what the organism is, one of the things that will help them is where the spore is located in the cell, if they catch it in that phase where it's still inside the cell and the cell itself hasn't deteriorated. So central is right there in the middle, that's A. Terminal would be which picture? C, yep and D, both of these. Subterminal, only one left, B. And the spore itself can be spherical or elliptical or oval in shape. So which one looks the closest to a sphere? D. And notice the, the spore caused the actual cell to be quite swollen, right? It's called being swollen. And then the rest are all kind of elliptical. That's the most common shape to a spore. So vegetative cell is actively metabolizing, growing, can be reproducing. It's the feeding phase. The spore mother cell is when it's starting to form, right, the spore within. And again, sounds like reproduction. It's not. 
right? It's just, it makes a copy of its DNA and it protects it, surrounds it in that coat with the keratin. And over time, the cell itself will even deteriorate. So you just have spores by themselves. So like I said, we'll only, we might get lucky and see spores inside of cells. Mostly you're probably going to see them outside. So this is when they're producing the spores. And this is just a more detailed cycle of forming those spores. So when we do the procedure today, again, we're going to use heat. And this is to really penetrate that dye into the spore coat, right, to really get it to go in. So we're going to stain the cells with malachite green. Even the bacterial cells will get stained. For decolorization, we just use water. It's enough to rinse it out of the cell itself. And then to be able to see the cells, we counter stain with saffron. And in this case, we'll actually end up with red. So we don't damage the cells too much, hopefully. And again, the spore will not take up that stain, right? It only takes up the stain when we heat them. It helps penetrate that stain in. So again, under the steam, right? So what you guys are going to do is do your um, acid fast ones first, because those are already been made for you. While you're waiting for your smears from your bacillus to dry on your light box before you heat fix, then you'll be able to stain those as your second set of slides on your light box. Again, you'll have, I mean, on your steam pot. Then again, you'll have to take it off, rinse it with water, and counter stain with saffron before we blot and look at it under the microscope. And so hopefully you'll see something like this. And again, notice the spores aren't inside the cells, right? They're all over the place. So green or bluish green. Why does this exercise call for an older five-day culture? Why are they old? They run out of food, which means that they're going to produce endospores, right? Conditions are harsh. Because the re so that's why I did old cultures, right? So that we definitely have spores to stain. They're old cultures, they're not gonna, if they're not old, if they're fresh, most of them are gonna be vegetative cells and you're not gonna have any spores to look at. So we need to try and encourage them to produce spores. One of the ways we do that is we grow them for a long time so they run out of food and they're starving. What does a positive result for the spore stain indicate about the organism? that has the ability to form endospores under harsh conditions, right? And in this case, we did employ harsh conditions, so we did see endospores. So we have some that don't have it, but you know... Mm -mm. We're not going to do a negative one. She asked, are we going to have some that don't have endospores? No. Or at least I hope not. <laughs> that brings us to, right, what happens, what does a negative result mean? So what you don't see, endospores, right? But what should you see? Uh, if you don't see endospores, what should you see? You should see the cells themselves, right? And most of the spore forms, as we saw, are, are broad-shaped. You should see the cells. Now, if you see the cells and no spores, so a negative result, might not mean that they're not an endospore per spore former. It might mean what? They just haven't formed it because conditions weren't poor or harsh enough, right? Usually nutrient depletion is very good, right? Very rarely does this not work today. <laughs> we should see spores. But just a negative result for this isn't a definitive negative, right? Just like pregnancy tests. Just because it comes out negative doesn't absolutely mean you're not pregnant, right? There are limitations in that test. There are limitations in this test, right? Did you really pr grow them under harsh conditions to make them form spores? If you don't do that, then you're not going to see spores. So why don't we need to do a negative control? Because you should always see what? Cells. If you don't see the cells, 
then something went wrong, right? So the cells themselves work as our negative control. So what's stained by the saffron? Cells, right? The cells themselves. Right. And again, the hard part isn't staining the cells. The hard part is staining the darn spores. So spores do not necessarily stain. And you guys, we did a bacillus. Do you guys remember that? We simple stained a bacillus. And you guys kind of saw some stuff where it didn't stain, right? Or you might have saw clear spots inside. Now, I know for a fact the organism I gave you is a spore former. So those were spores. But, if we didn't, if I didn't know that, right, if we gave you an unknown bacillus, and you saw those clear spots, what would you have to do next to be sure that you're actually looking at a spore? You gotta do the spore stain. Because there are other things sometimes that won't stain inside cells. You gotta be sure that you're looking at an endospore. You gotta do the endospore stain. should be our last one. Why are we doing this? To see spores, right? To know if it's a spore producer. We do our steps, five minutes, right? Decolorize, but before you guys do this, remember we got to make a bacterial smear. So you have your drop of water, you're going to put your drop of water on your slide, you're going to add your bacteria, you're going to spread it out, turn your light boxes on so they start getting warm. Air dry and heat fix. You guys are only making one slide per person, so one Bunsen burner is sufficient today, too. And then I'll give you guys your organisms. So again, gram pos um, spore positive, you're going to see the actual spores, whether they're inside or outside the cells, a greenish color. The cells should be red. All right, just because we're saying negative doesn't definitively say it's not a spore producer. Record your results. Right, on your sheet. Yeah. I think this is what I just said. Yeah. So, so as I said, after you get done, just take the screen, put it, and then each person take a slide. And it really doesn't matter which slide you get. Right, because they're all going to be the same on each lab bench. Right, we're all going to do them together. Uh, you take your filter paper off. Right, put it on a paper towel. You can transmit it, transport it to the trash without dripping dye all over our floors. Right, as you can see, they're already pretty well dyed. Uh, each person gets a slide. The slides that are pre-made have an A on it, and again, so that's what you know the top of the slide. Right, you want to keep track of the top of the slide. That's where the bacteria are. So I'll leave that last, whoop, wrong one, close that, that last procedure. But as I said, we're going to do, we'll start the acid fast while you guys are prepping. So what